I'm Claire Parker. And I'm Ashley Hamilton. And And this this is Celebrity Memoir Memoir Book Club. This week, I would like to thank Jiminy's, the maker of sustainable dog food and treats made with cricket protein that is better for the environment using less land and water to produce. Cricket protein is a superfood that is delicious, nutritious, and easy to digest for dogs. Save 25% on your first purchase. Go to Jiminy's.com slash worm25 and use the code worm25 at checkout. And thank you to Freshly for supporting Celebrity Memoir Book Club. Freshly has delicious, fresh, healthy meals ready to heat and enjoy in just three minutes. Stop stressing about dinner. Right now, Freshly is offering our listeners $125 off your first five orders when you go to Freshly.com slash worm. And thanks to Dipsy for supporting Celebrity Memoir Book Club. Dipsy is an audio app full of short, sexy stories. If you're looking to heat things up, there's a story waiting for you. Get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash worm. Claire, now that we're here, how would you describe Celebrity Memoir Book Club? I would describe it as mostly a joke, (laughs) a kind of little bit that's gone on too far. We're reading the book so that you don't have to, but you know, you're getting a little dish of Claire and Ashley. It's a reheated dish with a spice of our lives. Yeah, it's like if you were to remake a necklace, right? Like someone gives you their grandmother's diamond, a book, and you were like, it's fine, but I'd rather melt it down and turn it into- <laughs> Melt down diamonds? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Melt it down, <laughs> turn it into a hat. <laughs> Fit your style while still carrying the source material with you. Perfect. I do want to announce, first of all, we are taking next week off. I'm really, really sorry. I hope you don't hate us. We are doing a Patreon every Thursday forever. So if you cannot get enough of us. And if you miss us. We will be doing a Patreon episode. And I was thinking, Ashley, instead of texting all week, like just text something you want to talk to me about. And then we can just rehash everything on the podcast at once. We're not going to talk at all next week. We could talk. I feel like we... Don't ever run out of things to talk about. I would love you guys to be there for the absolute recap of our weeks apart. The other thing is we are still doing Nikki's unisex. It is the first Thursday of every month. So this one you missed. It was June 2nd. But next one, it'll be the first Thursday of July. And we just launched new merch. Summer style, baby. There's a worm on a surfboard. And what else do you even want besides to see a worm surf? Yeah, I just feel like it's summertime, baby, and all the worms are surfing across the USA. And then, Ashley, if you were a celebrity and you were to write a memoir, what would the title of last week's chapter be? Okay, can I do another birthday one? Yeah. It's just happy birthday to me. I know last week I was like blah about my birthday, but this week I have been thinking about what I want for my birthday because I've had like friends and family be like, hey, what do you want us to get you for your birthday? And most of the things I'm excited about are things that I want to get myself for my birthday, like emotional and physical treats. Like I feel like just giving myself a break about certain things. I was like, this is the year that I relax about some stuff or also I like want to like treat myself to a really nice manicure and I like just don't want anyone to buy it for me I just am in the mood to like treat myself to that for my own birthday and I feel very excited about finally being in a place in my life where I'm like wow I like that I have people that support me but I feel like I can get myself the things that I like and want and like do the things for myself that I like and want and I'm just excited about it excellent beautiful (laughs) Claire Yes. If you were a celebrity, what would you title the chapter about last week? Oh my God, paying the piper. Who's the piper? (laughs) The piper is old father time. (laughs) Oh. So we moved into our studio June 1st. That was yesterday. Sorry that this is not recorded for you live, but we moved a lot of furniture. We went all over the town. We did a Patreon episode about it, but we went all over town collecting furniture And at the time, I think I was alive with the passion and adrenaline of joy and excitement and ladies doing it for ourselves with just a little bit of help from my dad who did drive the truck and did help us move stuff. Yeah, he did also do some heavy lifting. (laughs) But I did a lot of heavy lifting. And let me tell you, at the time, I was feeling alive. I was feeling good. Today, I've never been in so much pain. I can't open doors right now. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you know when like your forearm... Yeah, because that only happens from furniture moving because when else would you ever use a forearm muscle? It happened to me one other time when I went rock climbing. Oh. And I couldn't button jeans or wash my hair for a week. I just had to like (laughs) walk around like a little zombie. The pain I have been in has been shooting, blinding, horrific. And I was just like, I'm too old to do this, man. It felt so good yesterday. And now I'm just like, Jesus Christ, my body is falling apart. Everything hurts. I was asleep. I woke up at 5 a.m. and like shooting pain because I like closed my fingers. I can't make a fist. I had to get 
toothpaste out of the tube with my elbow this morning. <laughs> I'm gingerly holding everything. I was holding a can of Coke between my two wrists on the way up. <laughs> I'm so sorry that this happened. I very rarely push myself physically. I'm almost never doing anything strenuous. And this just it annihilated me. <laughs> It'll get you. Well, now that you've died, you are blessed to understand the beauty of living twice. Just like Sharon Stone. Just like Sharon Stone in her memoir, The Beauty of Living Twice. Sharon Stone was born March 10th, 1958. She is 64 years old currently. And this book was written just last year when she was 63. Claire. Yes. What did you know about Sharon Stone before you opened this book? So almost nothing. I think I could have gone to my head recalled that she was in a basic instinct yeah. Or like I knew she was like a sexy lady and we'll get into this later, but I feel like the one thing I knew about Sharon Stone because she really was big in the nineties and I was born in the nineties. Basic Instinct, I think came out 92 when I was born. So I wasn't super aware of her until after she had kind of fallen out of favor of the spotlight. But I remember this SNL sketch where they were down at Katrina helping building buildings and she was there like being an idiot. She was a punchline in the sketch. Was she physically in the sketch or were they having like a Sharon Stone character? Being no, I think, I think it was Keenan Thompson was playing. Her. <laughs> so that's kind of all I knew. Yeah. I like knew that she was a lady who'd been in many movies and was pretty. I knew that there was a vague bit of crazy in the air. I've actually never seen Basic Instinct. Me neither. I just knew that there was that leg crossing scene that everyone went gaga for. What's the deal? You could see Vag. Yeah. You see Labia. I mean, I don't know. I've never seen it. Should I Google? No. Okay. I knew that that scene existed, but I've never even seen the scene. I just know her sitting in that white dress in that bluish dark room. And that's the only thing I knew about her. And now what do we know about her? Too much and also none. So this book, where do we start? How do we say? I, I described it as figure eights, I believe. Yeah. Figure eights around topics. Each chapter has about two to three seemingly unrelated topics that she starts at one, hops through the rest, maybe circles back to one, not in a way that ties the stories together or makes anything conclusive. She just re-mentions a similar topic. And then it ends. Like every single paragraph starts in one place and ends in a different place. There's no thesis statements. There's no like introductions that lead you into a story. It really is just like, chunks of information all in different areas it's very poetic i would say in the way it's written but i don't know if it's effective i would definitely say this is a book written by a woman who's read a lot but doesn't know that just because you've read good writing means you can do good writing writing style wise she's punching above her weight class it ends up being ineffective the language i think a lot it ends up being overly poetic to the point where you're like am i missing something what's going on i also do think that this memoir suffers from celebrityism, which is a new thing I'm inventing, which is when somebody has a very specific story they want to tell that it has nothing to do with their life as a star, but because they're a celebrity and their famous name is getting them the book deal in the first place, they have to give you the titillating, sensational Hollywood behind the scenes. And so I think this woman had some things to talk about that I think she wanted to get off her chest for her own sake, for her family's sake, and to see if she can help other women who have also been through something similar. But unfortunately, it gets kind of bogged down in trying to tell the overarching story of an entire human life, which is a tall order, especially if you're going to try to do it well. It's one thing to do a crescendo and be like, and in first grade, we moved. And in second grade, I had a boyfriend. And in third grade, I wanted to be an actress. Like, that's easy. And you can do bad memoirs well. But this wanted to be a good memoir. This wanted to be a Molly Shannon. And she just didn't have it in her. I think that she might have just not had the direction or I don't really know what happened here, but whatever it is, it is difficult to read. I really think this is a book that she wrote for herself and should have only had a hundred copies of and should they should have been given to her family. I also am sad because I do think this was also a book to combat the reputation she has of being crazy. And I think it doesn't help her at all. And I hate right now calling women crazy because I mean, Ashley was saying she seems just like a raw nerve walking around the earth. Like I don't disagree with a lot of it. I think she wants to help. I think she wants to try. And I think she has been through some things that she's right to be angry about. But unfortunately she seems a bit cuckoo bananas. (laughs) And this book only doubles down. And even I came at it with as much compassion as I think you can being like different generation. She has been through hell, blah, blah, blah. But still, man, 
there's some lines in here that you're just like, lady, what are you talking about? You need <laughs> to phone a friend who has just like a job in accounting in Ohio. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. you need to touch grass as the kids would say. She is a raw nerve and she does seem like a compassionate woman who only wants to do good. However, there is like a little bit of the way she sees the world, I think is not the same way that most of us see the world. And then there are things that we, you know, we try not to do research outside of these books. Like we try not to be tainted by outside opinions. We just try to like get into the book as best we can. But there are some things that were missing from this book that we had to look up. That were jarring in their absence. They like they left a void that we did not understand. There is like a notable chasm that you have to fill in. And so we looked it up and it changes the story. There's all of these questions. I don't know. You said like, so my dad used to text in this way that was like, he was answering questions that no one asked. <laughs> yeah. Like when I was in college, I would just get texts. I would be like, had mac and cheese. Now Thomas is off to soccer practice. And I'd be like, oh, did I ask you what you were up to? <laughs> and I kind of feel like celebrities have that where when there's a random section of their book that you're just like, why did you bring this up? It's because there was a headline and a scandal that I was unaware of that hugely impacted them that they're trying to get their story across. But because in the grand scheme of things, it's such a minute moment in anybody's life. It feels very out of place. But to the public eye, if you had been there for that scandal and that People magazine cover story, you would have been like, well, when is she going to answer for X, Y, Z? Also, if you have lived through that scandal and it's your life, it might feel like a lot. And so I do also feel like sometimes we see in celebrity memoirs, when it's your life, it feels like the inquiries about that event never stop because if someone Googles you, like that's what they find. But like no one really cares. It's just very relevant to you specifically. And you think like everyone's still thinking about this. Like they're not. Anyway, so let's get into this book. It opens in the fashion of many celebrity memoirs with a defining moment. And for her, her defining moment was a traumatic brain injury. Death Becomes Me is the chapter title. I opened my eyes and there he was standing over me just inches from my face. A stranger looking at me with so much kindness that I was sure I was going to die. He was stroking my hair, my head. God, he was handsome. I wished he were someone who loved me instead of someone whose next words were, you're bleeding into your brain. So this chapter describes a injury that she had where I guess one day she just passed out. She talks about a slow onset of symptoms mm -hmm. and it was two weeks after 9-11. So she thought she had anthrax poisoning as we all did. That was such a thing that we were supposed to be worried about. <laughs> I remember like opening mail being like, God, what could be in this letter? Is it a birthday card from my grandma or anthrax? Osama bin Laden had a chalkboard <laughs> and on the top of the to kill list was Ashley Hamilton. Age nine, Northbrook, <laughs> Illinois. <laughs> So she talks about experiencing a slow onset of symptoms, one day attempting to drive herself to the hospital, but then her foot goes numb and a stranger pulls over and like offers to help her get home. Why didn't she continue on to the hospital is a question I had. So she goes home. Eventually she passes out and one of her nannies finds her. They go to the hospital and no one knows what's wrong with her. And then she finds out that she's bleeding into her brain. So she calls her sister first. She goes, then I called my mom, a more difficult conversation for me since I didn't know she liked me very much. Like she is worried her mom won't come. Yeah. Well, she says like right after that handsome doctor says you're bleeding into your brain. He stood there gently touching my head and I just lay there knowing that no one in the room loved me. For the last few years throughout the late 90s, I had been chasing a love I didn't have, a love that I thought I did, but didn't belong to me. I chased literally leaving Hollywood and moving to Northern California. The thing about this chapter is it's told extremely out of order and it's used to do flashbacks and explanations and stuff. So Ashley is telling it how it went down IRL, but the chapter itself is very mixed up. Yes. And also, like we said, there are holes here that we had to look up later. At the time, she was still married. She does not mention that ex-husband one single time throughout this entire book. So this is the ex that she adopted her first son with. He is nowhere in this book. Yeah. And so she's talking about laying, dying at this hospital and how her parents rushed to help her and her friends and just like this incredible army of people who are surrounding her. And what's crazy is so, okay. So to finish the story that Ashley started, she's in the hospital. A doctor comes in. They're like, we have to do emergency surgery. She's unconscious when the doctor decides to do this. She wakes up as she's being rolled to the operating room and she's like, what the fuck is going on? And they won't tell her. And the doctor comes out and is like, I just got off the phone with People Magazine. I told them everything that's going on with you. And she's like, you're fired. Fires him on the spot. 
one nurse stands up for her and is like, we have to get her back to her room. She fired you. You're fucking out of here. They roll her back to her room or her family's there. They're on high alert. They get another fancier doctor to come in and help out. And they look, they can't figure out anything wrong. And so she just spends days in the hospital, like unable to see, unable to sleep. She's losing memory. She's like going in and out of consciousness. She's seeing ghosts. And then her dead grandmother comes to her at the foot of the bed and says, do not move your neck. Whatever you do, do not move. She puts like a teddy bear under her neck. She immobilizes herself. She says to somebody, I am dying. You have to help me. Because they all thought she was faking it at this point. They're like, you have to go home. And she's like, I can't go home. I'm dying. So they send up another camera up through her like arteries and look at the other side of her brain. So what had happened was that she, a couple... I think weeks beforehand had had surgery to remove benign tumors in her breasts. So post-surgery, she was told to sleep on her side where the blood was in her brain. It had seeped that way because she'd been sleeping on her side. So when they did the exploration of her brain, they looked on the side where the blood was. They didn't find anything. So then after she insists on another search, they search the other side of her brain and they find that she has almost a complete rupture of her right vertebral artery. Beautiful. Dr. Hamilton. <laughs> Listen, I didn't watch 18 seasons of Grey's Anatomy to not be able to pull that out right now. <laughs> <laughs> so they go in and they do emergency surgery like right then and there. She gets 12 little coils. Coils. So basically there are a bunch of different ways to handle this situation and any one of them could have gone horrifically wrong. She says she was given a 1% chance of survival. She's fully unconscious. Her family has to decide essentially in that moment which route they want to take knowing that All of them are deeply risky and any of them could be the wrong one. And then she obviously lives because she's still alive right now. Spoiler. And she says that she like felt on the table herself like enter the afterlife and then get punched back. It's like in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And so the other key things that come out in this chapter that she's telling this story and using it to sort of introduce you to the main cast of characters is... One, she's found by the nanny on the floor and she talks about how she has a one and a half year old Rowan at this point. Yeah. She had adopted him after suffering many late stage miscarriages and she's like, yeah, I'm lucky the nannies were able to take care of him and stuff. And like my family stepped in. And that was another thing where I was like, who is watching this goddamn baby? It's crazy to think that there was literally a husband. His father was watching him. His father was watching him and the nannies. And the nannies. But also I was like, who's making the key decisions here? And it was the father. The other thing is she talks about her parents and she says that she had a very tumultuous relationship with them, specifically her mother. And she says part of the reason she herself has never had a successful marriage is because the role models of relationships that her parents were were too good. Well, she says that her parents loved each other more than they loved their kids. They just were so in love with each other, but they didn't really have that much of an interest in their family, it seems. She says, parents who we would find necking on the sofa when we came in from playing. I grew up with parents who still danced in the yard after 50 years of marriage as if they were alone. I was not aware that there were people who just didn't love their spouses. I believe that even divorced people struggled with those big decisions. I was swimming in quicksand, losing all points of reference. I just like did think that that was a funny thing to be like, why do my marriages fail? My well, parents were too in love. So I didn't know how hard marriage was. Nobody told me. She also talks about, yeah, the breast cancer that she had. She had gone in for a routine check. They had found a large tumor. When they took it out, it turned out it was benign, but she had elected to get a double mastectomy. Yes. So that's where we are after chapter one. So she ends that chapter with those who I stayed with and for are my greatest lessons, teachers and guides, and not only the easy ones. Those who I got to live for are a world full of love and light. You are my reason. Those who have come into my life since with similar stories, some in different phases of their lives, light up my world. The love that I thought I didn't have, in fact, I had. Just not as I had imagined it. Not as the story had been told and retold a hundred million times to so many of us, making everything else we have done seem so small by comparison. I found a love that was so much more. A real love, a true love. No, I didn't get the fairy tale. I got real life. That's the story she wants to tell in this book. She wants to tell in the book about how she had a horrible relationship with her family her whole life. She almost died. It brought them all together and she found the love that she had been looking for, which was that her parents had loved her all along. Unfortunately, that gets extremely bogged down. She could have started small with like a great essay for the cut. Unfortunately, she wrote a whole book that also weaves in celebrity, some fun gossip, her humanitarian work. I would even say fun gossip. She throws in like one or two stories that are just like Hollywood, honey. Yeah, but did you have fun? No. (laughs) (laughs) So then we roll back the tape. We get to her childhood and she talks about growing up in Amish country in Pennsylvania. 
she was one of four children. She had a sister and two brothers. So I think it's her oldest brother, Mike, then her, then her younger sister, Kelly, then her youngest brother, Pat. Pat almost never comes up in this book. She ends this chapter talking about how he's the best one and he's the kindest and she loves him so much, but he got teased a lot because he was dyslexic. Yeah, but other than that, he was perfect. He was like handsome and kind. And then he just never comes up again in the rest of the book. Yeah, and then her older brother, Mike, I feel like we can sum up pretty quick. He was someone that she looked up to, someone that she wanted to impress. And then he like got really into drugs and drug dealing. And then he eventually graduated from weed to cocaine and was arrested by the FBI on television with kilos of cocaine and sentenced to 15 years to life. Mm -hmm. He had also been in the Air Force at one point. Yeah, and he had gotten like fucked up by the Vietnam War. Yeah, he got his finger ripped off. Not only that, but then when he went to the tent for other people with major injuries, he got gangrene. So then he almost lost his entire arm. And then he came back, got into drug dealing and went to prison. Okay, so her childhood. Her childhood is tough because... I think she needed to wait for her mom to die before she wrote this book. At the time of writing, her dad is dead, but her mom is still alive. And she very much has had a come to Jesus moment with her mom. And because of that, I don't think she like writes the childhood that she feels she had. I think she's embarrassed to throw her mom under the bus. But how it ends up reading is very confusing because she describes what seems to be an idyllic childhood. And then she's like, my childhood was horrible. My mom was so cold. Nobody loved me. It really is like two very different descriptions. And it's also in alternating chapters. So in this chapter, she says, if I moved while getting my hair combed or brushed out, the brush could be and was broken over my head. I grew to hate her, not only for that, but for her coldness. This circles back to the the situation in the first chapter where she talks about how she just didn't know whether or not her mom loved her. And then she's also like, when we were kids, my dad built us a tree house in the old oak tree. We climbed up on wooden slats to get to the bunk beds. She talks about putting on plays in the summer. They were like in a big old farmhouse. Her mom was a stay-at-home mom who always had every meal on the table from scratch. But she talks about living in an extreme poverty. And I'm like, I don't think you ever did. If you always had food on the table and you guys always were clothed and you always were housed and your dad always had a job, you weren't rich. You weren't, maybe you weren't even middle class. Her dad worked in a factory, but it seems if your mom could afford to be a stay-at-home mother, make every meal. Unfortunately, that's pretty good. (laughs) And then she goes into her parents' relationship. They got married when her mom was 16 years old. So she says in this chapter, I grew up not knowing my mother. In fact, I grew up not liking my mother. She was efficient and taught me how to do everything, to cook, to clean, to sew, to bake, to plant and garden, to can food, to put away the clothes in perfect order. I grew to hate her, not only for that, but for her coldness. I knew she had grown up with a different family than her siblings had, having been given to another family when she was nine years old. I thought it was because they were so poor. What I didn't know until now, until I wrote this book and needed to try to talk to her, was the truth. The truth was that she was too ashamed to tell anyone. The truth, I'm sure, she had never told her own husband, my dad. So the truth was that her mother had been so horrifically beaten by her family that at one point when she was changing the locker room at school, they saw her back and how scarred it was. And she was removed from her family and given to another family who basically needed just a servant. Yeah. So she was just like cooking and cleaning for this family. She like loved them because at least they didn't hurt her. Basically, she says that the fact that their only real bond and interaction was her mom teaching her how to cook and clean. This was because this is how she knew how to love. This was the best love she had ever gotten. She has this understanding and realization of the way her mom receives and shows love is essentially through acts of service. Her mom's number one thing is that you have to learn how to stand on your own two goddamn feet. But she also continues to circle back to this notion, which was true in the way she grew up, which was like not knowing whether or not her mom loved her. One of her core truths is that she grew up without a parent who loved her. Even though now as an adult, having talked to her mom and understanding her mom's childhood, she knows that that wasn't true, but it is like too baked in. My father, on the other hand, came from a super rich family, oil drillers. So then she tells the story of her father's family. Basically, her grandparents were the first oil drillers in Pennsylvania, oil land, and they ran a super successful business. The problem was one day the oil rig blew up and killed his father and her grandmother, her dad's mom, was not allowed to inherit the business because she was a woman. So it automatically went down to their nephew, who was 18 at the time. And fucked it up. And fucked it up within a matter of two years. So then they were like reduced to rubble. <laughs> but she like loved her paternal grandmother and her paternal side of the family. They really like took her in, were very loving and made her feel wanted. They would come pick her up and take her out. Also, they were just hot as hell. Yeah, she said they were all gorgeous and smart and beautiful. And her grandmother was so smart and had all these friends. And her father had raised her her to be like 
I don't want to happen to you what happened to my mom. Like, I don't want you to be held back because of your sex. I want you to be aggressive and competitive and live in a world where you can take on just as much as the men. So then we get to the next section, style. So this chapter starts with the idea that she might talk about boyfriends. So she starts talking about her first sexual experiences. And then she's talking about the drama in her hometown. So she talks about like the, her first ever sexual experience, which isn't really sexual, but in first grade, a boy jumped out from behind the stairs and tried to kiss her. So she bit him in self-defense. And then she was sent home and got in a ton of trouble for three days because she bit and he was left okay. And she was like, I just felt that I couldn't tell on him. And I think that that's a story that sets mm-hmm. the tone. So then she tells a story about hometown drama. Yeah, she really like loves to get into the weeds of whatever backcountry fucking world she was from. She's explaining her friendship with a girl named Pixie. Pixie's Pixie's dad tries to shoot her uncle's best friend for sleeping with Pixie's mom. Yeah. I don't know. It's all very like to reiterate my point. I really believe that this was a book that she wrote for her family. This is very much somewhere where she almost didn't know what to do with herself. So she just had to take the insides and put it on paper just to organize it all out. She also has memory loss from her brain thing. So I wonder if she was like, I just want to get everything that I know down. Yeah. This is almost like an exercise. So she talks about her uncle Beaner, who I guess was found dead the day before her basic instinct premiere. And he was dead face down in the snow covered in blood. And so people thought it was a murder. And I wonder if that was another headline that she had to explain or if that was just like a piece of personal news that she was like, that's a chapter. And then she talks about really getting along with her aunt and her grandma. She says that they would pick her up and take her away for the summer. It made her feel like she mattered. So then she talks about styles, what you do with what's wrong with you. Barbara Streisand's nose, Clark Gable's ears, Danny DeVito's size, share. <laughs> and let's face it, they're all loaded with style. Clear, crisp, finger snap of style, washed to squeaky clean perfection by years of heartache. Those tears begin when you're a kid and you don't get what you think of as the good thing and you quietly, courageously figure out how to make the thing you've got so fabulous that it becomes the thing, what everybody else wants to have, except now you've got the only one. Some of us have gone a long way on that ticket and I, I like that. She talks about feeling wrong growing up. And this stems from her mother's coldness, from not feeling like she has a place within her family. She talks about being bullied for being odd. At one point she brought a bat to school and she thought it would be fun and everyone would like it. But then a live bat, not like a sports bat, like a animal, like a vampire bat. (laughs) Then she talks about a girl just like slapped her across the face at school one day. Yeah. Like a popular girl came over to her and then just hit her. And then she says, When I became famous, People Magazine did an interview and spoke to people in my town. She told them that when I was in school, I was a snob. Just goes to show you. You can't believe everything you read. Fuck the haters, man. But then she tells this story and this is one where I'm like, okay, what did this have to do with anything? Yeah. So she talks about her first time at the Cannes Film Festival for Total Recall. Her luggage never arrived. So she didn't have anything to wear. So she wore like a funky thrown together outfit and says, I should add that none of the beautiful women present thought to offer me a hand here or lend me something of theirs. I wasn't famous or important, but I was young and pretty and threatening. I don't know that if someone that you don't know. So like this was her first time at the festival. She doesn't really know anyone there. She is not viewed as a contender necessarily. She's not famous at this point. She's just an up and comer. I don't know that you would see her and like talk to her about her luggage and then be like borrow a dress of mine. It does seem like she showed up in a place where she knew no one and was like, why didn't anyone just like see the look on my face and know that I needed to borrow a top? And then somebody does come and help her. So it all works out. And then she just talks about doing Total Recall. There had been an earthquake in Mexico City. And Grace Jones was downstairs drinking with her boyfriend. And she was too scared. I don't know. I don't really know what she's talking about. She says that Arnold Schwarzenegger was very nice to her and very helpful and helped push her to become better. And then gave her this piece of advice for answering questions. When doing publicity, answer the question they should have asked. Brilliant, I have to say. Unless it's none of anyone's business. Then I ask the question about them. He taught me that too. And then she says Steven Seagal sucks. And I don't even know why. Yeah. I don't know what any of this has to do with the beginning. Then she goes back to her childhood. She talks about being kitchen sink Irish. She says there are two kinds of Irish families, lace curtain Irish and kitchen sink Irish. She talks about when she was able to pay off their mortgage and her parents were so happy. Dad was mother's night. He stood when she entered the room, pulled her chair out of the table and thanked her every night and told her how delicious her dinner was. Her mom would wait at the door every day to make him laugh and do something crazy to make him laugh. This is like more of the idyllic childhood stuff that kind of contradicts some of the other stories. She says, our childhood was full of big Christmases. Even if the gifts were small, they were exciting, all wrapped nicely and hidden with great secrecy. She was her dad's helper and was never put in a typical gender role playing position at home. 
All of us learned how to build a house. And since we grew up in Amish country, we learned how to do it the Amish way, building the frame and the sides and then raising them with ropes. I mowed the lawn, shoveled the snow, climbed the trees and played golf. She had like a very outdoorsy, tomboyish upbringing. They were always running around in the woods. Yeah. (laughs) Probably eating bugs. Sure. Do you know who loves to eat bugs? Bug? Bug. Bug. (laughs) And you could too, or your dog could too, if you care about the environment. Consider reducing your dog's carbon paw print with Jiminy's sustainable dog food and treats made from cricket protein. Cricket protein uses less water and land to produce, so it drastically eliminates greenhouse gas emissions versus traditional animal protein dog food. One bag of Jiminy's cricket protein treats saves 220 gallons of water versus traditional animal protein treats. Plus, dogs go gaga over it. If you want to make a defiant puppy sit, try giving him a cricket snack because boy oh boy will she sit and occasionally even stay. Jiminy's is easy for dogs to digest because cricket protein contains a fiber that is prebiotic, which supports a healthy gut, and it's good for dogs with food sensitivity or allergies, much like my little allergy baby, who got friggin' pink eye from her own allergies. Don't ask. I have been using Jiminy's treats to help train my little bug, and she is enjoying it so much. She gets so happy when we're about to do some training because she's like, listen, if I just listen to you for two minutes, I'm going to get to eat some incredible treats. I don't know if she's going to keep doing it after I put the treats away, but while those treats are out, I've got a good listener on my hands. Please check out Jiminy's Dog Food and Treats made with Cricket Protein, a sustainable superfood that is delicious, nutritious, and easy to digest for dogs. To learn more and save 25% on your first purchase, go to Jiminy's.com slash Worm25 and use the code Worm25 at checkout. That's Jiminy's.com, J-I-M-I-N-Y-S.com slash Worm25 and use the code Worm25. Okay, but that's what Bug eats. What do I get to eat, Ashley? If you're feeling famished in the moment, consider Freshly. Fast, pre-cooked, never frozen, never tasteless, and never over-processed. Freshly is food that is fast, but not fast food. Quality meals without any of the hard work, without any of the dishes, without any of the stress that comes with getting home after a long day and having to cook something for yourself. Are you kidding me? These meals are designed by nutritionists, cooked by chefs, and then delivered fresh to your home. They are nutrient-packed meals that require not a lick of cooking. So honestly, perfect for you and I, two traditionally not talented cookers. Stop stressing about dinner right now. Freshly is offering our listeners $125 off your first five orders when you go to freshly.com slash worm. That's $125 off at freshly.com slash worm. So after they were done rummaging through the woods, and now that they're fully fed on brain food, it's time for school. Sharon was a little bit of a genius, it seems. Yeah. She skipped first and second grade, but then they were like, actually, that was a bit much. Go back to first grade. And she said that was like a really shameful moment to be demoted like that. But she was five. Then she gets into her first couple of boyfriends. Well, she's all over the place. Then she talks about going to college. She's like, I loved school. When she was 15 years old, her high school started a program where they were sending a handful of gifted kids to college. But then she says they kind of discontinued that program. And then she was back at school, but tutoring other kids. And she found out like no one in her school could read. But during her time at the college, she says, I studied painting, astronomy, more golf, And I also did an independent study in radio production, which involved meeting my teacher on Tuesday mornings with something interesting to talk about over breakfast at the local IHOP. He was brilliant and elderly and I think unwell. This was the class I worked the hardest for because he was so kind to me. He bought me huge breakfasts, which would have been expensive for me then and hard to come by. And we talked for at least two hours at a time. Lady, you had a boyfriend. (laughs) I don't think that was class. You were the cheapest sugar baby of all time. What do you mean for two hours every Tuesday you talk to an old man at an IHOP? (laughs) So then she gets into her boyfriends. Yes. So she went to prom with this guy named Ray and then Ray died. He was hit by a drunk driver while he was on a motorcycle and he broke his jaw. And because the driver just left him at the scene, he choked and died on his own blood. Mm. So Sharon is very anti-drunk driving. She thinks everybody should have a breathalyzer in their car. Yeah, she is very involved with Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Then she dates her brother's drug dealing partner who only sells marijuana. So to her, it's like less of a big deal. And she talks about how scary her brother became. 
because as he got more into cocaine, he got like a big scary dog. People were constantly doing coke at his house and there's a lot of guns everywhere and she just started feeling distance from him. Then we get to her first serious boyfriend, D. So she goes to college. She's dating a guy named D and she ends up getting pregnant and she doesn't know she's pregnant. Someone just notices that she's gained weight. So she takes a pregnancy test. She realizes she's pregnant. They don't really have accessible abortion clinics in Amish country, Pennsylvania. So he finds a place in Ohio and drives her there. It seems like he was quite supportive of this experience, but overall it was so deeply stigmatized in the moment. And I mean, it's honestly still pretty stigmatized. Yeah, she went to this place in Ohio where they didn't believe she was old enough because she didn't know she was pregnant. They couldn't tell how long she had been pregnant, so they determined whether or not they should even allow her to have it. They gave it to her and there was no counseling, no help, no explanation for aftercare. She just like bled. So she goes back to her dorm and she never speaks to her boyfriend again because she just couldn't handle it. Years later, a Planned Parenthood opens up and she goes to get birth control and is able to talk to someone about it. And she was like, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. And so she's also very involved and helping to get Planned Parenthood's funding because she thinks it's so important for people to have someone to talk to and explain things to them. Listen, I agree. So then she talks about how she had always wanted to pursue a career in film. She said she thought she'd be a director, having no idea that women were not invited into this branch of the biz. Of course, once folks got a look at me, they decided for me. I guess at some point she got the entertainment industry bug. She doesn't really... She always wanted to be in film. And I just don't think she knew how. And her parents were like, you can't go be an actress. That's a crazy thing to be. My mother saw I lean forward on the Merv Griffin show. And suddenly this became something, someone she could relate to. Also, so she says that after her brother got arrested for being a drug dealer, her parents actually were like, you know what? Whatever makes you happy. Well, no, not even that. It was that because he was arrested by the FBI, there was all this pressure for him to speak and like name higher ups. And so their family started getting death threats and people he knew were getting murdered by drug dealers. So they weren't just like, ah, oh, follow your dreams. At least it's not Coke. They were like, get out of here. We don't want you murdered. <laughs> She says, my parents began to believe that they should get me out of town. I, of course, agreed for those reasons and my own. And then her mom saw Eileen Ford on the Merv Griffin show and was like, you should talk to Eileen Ford. So they just go to New Jersey to stay at her aunt's house and find Eileen Ford. And Eileen calls her fat, but wants to sign her. She told me that she liked to throw me down the flight of stairs. I had just come up and bounced the fat off my ass, but that she would take me. I didn't know what to make of that. <laughs> me either. So she then becomes a model and more of like a special, she says she's a special assignments girl, which means like funny faces modeling, not like funny faces, but like, like beautiful faces. Yeah. Yeah. She was a commercial model. Commercial. <laughs> she wasn't like a clown. I know, but she like talks about herself that way. She's like, I was always there to do like the hard, weird jobs Yeah, because I was a special assignments girl, not a beautiful girl. Well, and she was a beautiful girl, obviously. She wasn't high fashion. So she would do things like sunscreen commercials and household goods. Yeah, she, she was just commercial. When I left home to move to New York, my dad gave me this one inch little square cutout from the paper with Babe Ruth's stats on it. It said that he struck out so many times, but he had one of the highest batting averages. Dad said, just make sure that you keep getting up to bat, honey. I think that's cute. She still has that, that piece of paper. That is cute. But then she says that her dad also used to beat her a lot. She said eventually she just started to see her father as weak because at first she was getting beaten over things she did wrong. But then when she like couldn't even figure out what she was being beaten about, she was like, oh, that's just like weakness within him. So one day she just went downstairs and said, what's the matter? Do you need to hit me some more to feel like a man? I was 14. He started to cry. I told him that I didn't love him and that I had never loved him, that I would never love him. I was so cold, so still. He was so heartbroken. He never hit one of us again. She said, I was free from them both. From then on, I was my own guide. That didn't stop me from continuing to come home, continuing to argue with him and continuing to need his approval. After all, he was my dad. So then she goes through this period of her life where she is a very successful model traveling all over the world. And definitely there's a distance between her and her parents because they feel like she thinks she's too good for them. Her dad always thought she was pretentious, but she did employ a lot of the things her dad taught her. I was Joe Stone's daughter and he taught me that if you want respect, you have to demand respect, not ask for it, not hope for it, but demand it. Now that didn't always go down too well. I was fired and got blackballed here and there, got talked about, laughed at, and ultimately when I did Basic Instinct, written off as a sex star, as if. She sums up most of her career right here. <laughs> she also talks about her scars and the ones she's proud of. And this is where she mentions a story from her childhood where I'm like, how could this not have come up yet? She at one point was on a horse that went wild 
and she ran into a clothesline and it tore her neck in half basically. So she was stuck to this horse. She couldn't get her foot out of the stirrup. Her mom saw her get tangled in this clothesline and came out and basically freed her from the horse. She had an 18 inch slice across her neck, plasma and blood just gushing the fuck out. They get in the car, they go to the hospital. She's just in the hospital and no one knows what to do in this situation because it's a middle of nowhere hospital with like no resources. No one knew what to do and her dad just goes, someone sew her up. So they sew her up and do a treacherous job of it. So she just had a huge scar across her neck for most of her life until she like started undergoing revision treatments to have it fixed. And then she talks about how she got into acting. She was a model and her friend needed an extra for a Woody Allen movie. She gets there, she meets Woody. He's like, great, you can be an extra. The day that she's on set, some girl who was supposed to play a part didn't show up. And so they go to her specifically and he's like, hey, do you want to play this part? You have to make out with a subway window. And she was like, I would fucking love to. So she makes out with a subway window with all that she's got. And then they end up writing her a larger part. Yeah, they were like, you're actually really vibing. You and that subway have so much chemistry. Yeah. We, we have to see to where this relationship goes. Date it. And so then she gets written into the movie and that's her first acting role. So she hightails it out to Los Angeles. Then we skip through a huge chunk of her life. She basically says she spent years trying to get roles and making it to like the final two and never really getting that break. She was in a bunch of random things, but she never got that thing. She was always one of the final girls and then they picked someone else and her agent was like, it's because you're a terrible actor. So she goes to an acting class and this is where she meets Roy London, who is apparently a legendary acting coach. He taught Brad Pitt, Robert Downey Jr., Forrest Whitaker, Gina Davis, Gary Shandling. It turned her into a great actor. Shortly after graduating his program, she lands Basic Instinct and she was 32 years old. And when she got Basic Instinct, she had done 18 movies since she was 32, but she had had big roles. So she had done Total Recall with Michael Douglas already. And even though she was the star of that movie, that wasn't good enough. He like literally refused to screen test with her for Basic Instinct. Her agent broke into an office, stole a script and got a read for her that they sent in that they just kept throwing back into the mix by virtue of begging. And after 12 actresses turned down the role of Basic Instinct, they finally were like, all right, we'll give it to this bitch. She won't go away. Okay, so now let's get to what was sort of a headline of this book. That famous scene where she crosses and uncrosses her legs and you can see her whole body. She was wearing underwear in that scene and they asked her to take off her underwear because it reflected in the camera and they were like, we can't see anything. It just like makes the shot bad if you keep underwear on. So she took her underwear off and obviously in the final cut of the movie, it's fully a vagina shot. That's, I think, the only thing I know about that movie is that you see Sharon Stone's vagina. And when she saw the screening of the movie, she went and hit the director. She called a lawyer to consult about her options. And they basically said, there are some things you can try And no one took her seriously. They vehemently denied that I had any choices at all. I was just an actress, just a woman. What choices could I have? And eventually she decides to not press forward with any of these potential options because she says, for years I had getting pummeled doing a bunch of crap movies and so-so television back in the day when TV wasn't king. I was 32 years old when I got that job. I told my agent that if they got me in the door, I would get the job. And I knew this was the last chance. I was aging out of the business and I hadn't really gotten into yet. I needed a break. So she basically knows that for the good of this movie and for her own career, she kind of has to, she just gets bullied into it by like both herself and obviously the production and the fact that that shot even existed at all. So she talks about how Paul is an absolute fucking asshole. Paul, like when she had first met him, wouldn't stop calling her Karen instead of Sharon. And by the end... He obviously had to learn her name. So then she says that when she had first come into Hollywood, everyone told her she was unfuckable. When I saw the film, I not only saw that I could make myself beautiful in this way with the top talents in Hollywood highlighting all of my best parts and hiding my flaws, I could quite convincingly cover my vulnerabilities by removing the tender, fragile self at my exterior. It wasn't that I vowed to be this character from now on, but I would be less weak on the outside, less available to be eaten alive. You see, I was still making decisions based on experiences and scars of an eight-year-old and those deep cuts and broken bonds of security that I had not yet actively learned to replace. I was still faking it till I made it. I was sort of good at it, but for the first time, I was asking to learn how to know something new. I was asking for the world to change. I was asking for permission to say why. I was asking to be seen and respected. I was asking to be known. And so then she gets into what is essentially the crux, I would say, of her core trauma and every problem in her life and what is actually the story she wanted to tell in this book. Yes. So when she was eight years old, 
she was held in a room where her grandfather raped her younger sister. And it seems like this happened more than once. I mean, she describes like an awful scenario where her mom would drop them off and then the grandmother was, would like block the room and she would just sit there paralyzed and have to watch. And she says, you see, I was the witness, not the victim. The little eight-year-old witness of my five-year-old sister being robbed of her innocence. I stood paralyzed in that dusty, dimly lit, awful place, trapped by a woman standing in the exit so we couldn't get out. My grandmother, who was beaten every day by the devil in the room, made a devil herself. She says, of course, I realize saying I wasn't a victim here seems absurd, but it was almost like I wasn't there. It was the first time I felt myself leave my body and observe from somewhere else. When I play the serial killer in Basic Instinct, I tapped into that rage. It was terrifying to look into the shadow self and to release it into this film for the world to see, to allow people to believe that I was like that. Even more to let myself know that I have or had darkness within. I can say that it was and is the most freeing thing I've ever done to engage my full self so very deeply and to free that dark angel. To know that I was angry, to know that I was so angry that I would have loved to stab Clarence to death was incredibly freeing. As we are learning, abuse comes in all kinds of ways and our reactions come in all ways. Generation after generation, we will still be learning just how to talk about and deal with the abuse without being abusive in our very discussions, sensationalistic in our interest, cruel with our concern. So then she goes on to say she loved when Basic Instinct came out and people loved it and she was so proud of the movie and then the critics came out. And the next morning we had a glorious celebratory breakfast and the horrible reviews came out. But she doesn't like give a ton of time to them. That's all she says. What is a critic? Someone who sees movies for free and then tells you what they think. What is an audience? Someone who tells you how a movie makes them feel. Yeah. I actually do think critics have gotten out of control. Well, this was 30 years ago. I know. They've always been out of control, I suppose. <laughs> So then she goes on to say, I think I'm not alone in processing some pent up female rage. It's unnerving to know for me that this rage was so controlled. I think because I was forced to control it for so long to keep it hidden as though it were my shame. This was the nature of abuse in my era. Everything carried the heavy weight of threat, not only to me, but those I loved or was supposed to love or whatever the fuck was going on there. And then she talks about how her and her sister didn't know if they could speak out about it because they didn't want to be reduced to like a headline. And she talks again about the relationship she has with her mother and how she's since talked to her mom about it. Her mom is deeply regretful that she left them with him. And she says, I have so much empathy and compassion for her. After all, she didn't get parents at all. I so wish she too had a mother she could talk to. And she talks again about learning that her mom's love came in a form different from what you imagine as a mother's love. She says, while my mother didn't mother me per se, as I've said, she was a fabulous homemaker and we were all self-sufficient. I don't think we understood at the time that parts of our upbringing were so harsh because no one did anything at all for either of our parents. There's that compassion. So then she talks about her next movie, The Quick and the Dead, which is like not a movie I've literally ever heard of. Me either. She got Gene Hackman to be in it because of her. Russell Crowe, who was a nobody from Australia, was in it because of her. Leonardo DiCaprio got cast in it as a 14-year-old boy. She had to pull... Leonardo DiCaprio's salary out of her own. She was like, this kid is so good. And they were like, he is a no name. And she insisted. She also had Sam Raimi be the director. From Spider-Man. And nobody knew who he was at the time. And she basically was like, if you let him direct it, he'll do it for nothing just for the experience. And then she also wanted to pick who did the music. She thought it'd be cool to have like modern new music. So she pulled our boy Danny Elfman from Oingo Boingo. Is he our boy? Yeah, we've read about him from like other books. Which ones? I'm pretty sure in Red Hot Chili Peppers, I'm pretty sure Anthony Kiedis was like into Oingo Boingo. And I, I think he was mentioned in Travis Barker's book too. Anyway, so she wants Danny Elfman to do the score. And they were like, that's absurd. Do you know what else Danny Elfman has done the music for? Nightmare Before Christmas. He also did the Batman theme. So he has really come into being honestly an iconic movie scorer, like a Trent Reznor level, even b bigger, I would say. And so the fact that she had that vision and they said, no, this is a, a real note of fuck you. Yeah, she says, I can say that studio heads are not always ahead of the curve, to put it kindly. And she says, most actresses take a producer credit as a vanity credit and you just get paid and do nothing. But she really likes to be involved in the decision making and people fucking hate that about her. Also on The Quick and the Dead, she starts dating this guy who was the second AD. He was nine years younger than her. So for the star of this movie, who was like a huge Hollywood star and producer to be dating the second AD, that's wild. Okay, so she, it seems, was head over heels in love with him. I don't know why he wouldn't be head over heels in love with her, but she says all of the time my fame was growing and crushing his spirit. He was doing everything for me and for us, and my life was a rocket. He used to wish I was a diner waitress. I once had been, and now this. I will say if you're a second AD and you start dating the star of a movie and then you're mad that she's a star, like, fuck you, man. 
She doesn't speak ill of him in this book. He seems like he's been a, a crutch for her. She says that she loved him for two decades, even though they only dated for a few years. Two years. <laughs> two years. I was like, okay, 20 years they were together. I was like, that must have been who she adopted. Like, and that's not true. They dated for two years and then she got married to somebody else that she doesn't mention. And she had been married to someone else before too, when she was much she younger. She mentions him like briefly, I think. Yeah. So I will say it does seem like he was a real crutch in her life, but... I am annoyed by the fact that he started dating a movie star and then got mad that she was a movie star. He like really took care of her though when she was in casino. He would make sure everything was okay. I think there was a 10 year period of her life where she was so fucking famous and just working nonstop. And I imagine he became her PA. I mean, I think her perspective was like my star was crushing him, but it sounds like he was working a full-time job and then he would get home after a 16 hour shift and like make sure she had what she needed. Yeah. I think he very much fell into a caretaker role. And I think if you date somebody when you're that big of a celebrity and they are literally in a role that supports you and nine years younger than you, normally I would agree with you, but I do wonder if in this situation. I see both sides. We eventually broke up when it was all got to be too damn much. My health was failing and I was told if I was going to have a baby, it was then or never and Bob wasn't ready. I mean, that's fair. But they were together when she was nominated for an Oscar in Casino. And she had told her acting coach, Roy, who she loved, that her goal in life was to hold her own across from De Niro. And she's like, I think I did it in Casino. Yeah, and so she held her own so hard, they nominated her for a friggin' Oscar. Uh, and then we get to this story. 9-11. So on 9-11, they were in Nantucket. And she says this, which I don't know that adds up. She's like, on 9-10, we had been in a karaoke bar all night after golfing all day. I am not much of a karaoke -er and not a drinker. So when we got back to the old house we had rented, I stayed up to watch the morning news and was sitting there watching when the second plane hit the tower. I questioned this. The second plane hit at like 10.30 a.m. Right. It's not like she, they were up at 4 a.m. and she stayed up to watch the 5 a.m. news. I mean, this happened when we were all at school. I, I know. I remember 9-11. Never forget it. Anyway, so they panic and they're like, we have to get off this island. They make the last ferry uh, yeah, to get back to Boston. So then they drive straight to Pennsylvania. As a local 9-11-er, <laughs> as someone who was like pretty immediate to it, it really fucking annoys me when I have to hear people's stories about like how scared they were when they were truly thousands of miles away. I don't need to hear about like your panic to get to safety in Nantucket. You were safe there. You should have stayed put. And I get that at the time you might have been panicked not know what's going on, but I don't think it deserves a reference to be like, so there I was in Wyoming and I had heard about this thing happening in New York and I, I scrambled. I was like, yeah, they weren't coming for you. This has nothing to do with you. And then she had to drive all the way across the country to make it to the Bay Area to throw out the first pitch at an Oakland A's game that weekend. As I jogged out towards the mound with the number 11 on my back, helicopters overhead and snipers strategically placed throughout the stadium, I realized how much the crowd wanted, perhaps needed me to make it to the plate. I will say what healed America uh, after 9-11 was Sharon Stone's first pitch at the baseball stadium. I remember being like, thank God. Thank God she made it to the plate. I wish she hadn't even mentioned 9-11 at all in this story and just said, I got to throw out the pitch and I did make it to the plate because most men don't. Most men don't. What? Steve Aoki did not. Yeah, almost nobody does. But she had trained. She practiced. She wasn't some idiot who went up and was like, I could probably figure it out. It's, there's an art. There's an art. And also like a strength. It's just like hard to throw a ball that far. But this is a 9-11 story about a baseball and not a regular story about a baseball. Then, of course, this puts us right back where we started. A couple weeks later, she's getting her brain surgery where my ruptured right vertebra vertebral, vertebral artery was replaced by coils in a complicated attempt to save my life. I woke up in intensive care with one perfect chance of surviving. There was a nurse there who was like trying to find a vein for her painkillers and started questioning her about all of her bad roles. <laughs> Can you imagine someone waking up from brain surgery and them being like, so why AF wasn't such a success, was it? <laughs> so her healing was a long and slow process. Her hearing had been modulated. She like lost a lot of range with her hearing. Directional hearing is what she says. So she has to like point her ear at what she's listening to. Her vision is really messed up. Her memory, she lost a lot of short term memory. She lost depth perception. She lost feeling in her leg. Yeah. She started to stutter. And they told her that that was just all 
side effects of the surgery and the injury and don't worry about it. And eventually she talks to Quincy Jones who had survived two aneurysms and Quincy Jones was like, you got to talk to my guy. And his guy was like, no, you're having seizure activity. You need to try new medications. So she tries new medications and her symptoms slowly begin to heal over the course of like two years. But she says that in this time, she has to slow down so enormously that it changes her persona. Whereas once I was like quick-witted and fast, I would have to stop, listen to what someone said and then respond. And she was like, I feel like I was becoming a new person or like the old Sharon Stone was gone. And she didn't know if people would accept who she would become. She's like, I couldn't be glamorous anymore. I couldn't be quick and work hard. I had to be a steady, softer person. And I didn't know if if I would like that about myself or if other people would accept that about me. She says, I didn't know if I'd ever be well enough to work again, to remember my lines look presentable and be photographed as Sharon Stone. I'd lost my place in line. I didn't know if living at all was an accomplishable task given my state of affairs. I also just want to point out, so based on our external research, this was when she was married. So isn't that weird that she never mentions the husband? Because this entire time she's... I did have that question, like, who was raising her child? Well, this was obviously a deeply, deeply contentious breakup. Yeah. Because as we're about to get to, there's custody problems. But also it's so weird that she doesn't mention him at all. And she, I guess what she is saying is that I didn't have any love. I wasn't loved. Nobody loved me. What she was saying is she wasn't single and unloved. She was supposed to be in a relationship at that time and she wasn't feeling cared for. And she does make a couple of insinuations like I had some friends support me the whole way, but other friends became overwhelmed and dropped off. And I guess that other friend was her husband. Not such a good friend after all, I suppose. So then she gets into her philanthropy and she is a huge part of AMFAR, which is an HIV AIDS organization that raises money. And she's like, you may think you know why I care about AIDS. You may think it's because I know so many people who have been affected and died from it, but it's actually a secret reason. And the secret reason is that she spent a year filming a movie in Zimbabwe once. Where she like witnessed a lot of people suffering from AIDS. You didn't need to explain to me why disease is sad. Yeah. I didn't need to know your secret reason. (laughs) There are some things in this book. And once again, I do actually think that she has good intentions. Obviously, if she's like dedicated an enormous portion of her life to AIDS research and fundraising. Beyond the fundraising, she seems to be very much doing the work. Like we'll get into it later, but she is personally buying sleeping bags and handing them out to people, unhoused people on the streets. Like it does seem like she is getting her hands dirty and doing as much as she can for people all the time. I think that if she cares about something, she will show up for it. She's not throwing money at things. She's there. But some of the things she says, I'm like, I wish you had just actions speak louder than words to yourself because the words are a lot. So she says, talking about surviving extreme near-death circumstances. I speak with soldiers about this. I spoke to Aaron Ralston, the guy who cut off his arm to get out from under a boulder in a remote part of Utah. That's like the story from 127 Hours. She says, each time I meet someone who's been to the edge, it's like we have a shorthand. There is an absence of baggage. There is a need to serve. So this is like about her call to service. This is the first of many times in this book that she compares herself to a soldier. At one point, she says being on a film crew is like the army for hippies. Yeah. With like the same strictness and dedication. And I do feel like I understand where she's coming from. I'm just saying the way she compares herself to a soldier a lot, it's a creaky moment for me. But she does care a lot about fundraising and safety around HIV AIDS, finding a cure, finding a vaccine. Then she gets into, so she says that she thinks she had her stroke because I let myself get too far off from my natural path, too far away from my true journey in life. I wonder if the body cries out when we are not following our natural path, when we're trying to fit that square peg into a round hole. And so then she says, over the course of my life, I've come to understand that when it comes to abuse, many people do not fully grasp that is the abuser who looks strong, compelling, and in control. The victims of abuse can look shredded and insane as if they are high or lying or in some way too fragile to be believed or depend on. Their desperation comes off unreliable. The abuser seems still solid in control. That is the person who has threatened the other person into submission. Of course, they're in control. The fact gets lost that ultimately the abuser is the weak person the person broken and severely troubled, the person with a mental issue. Even if an abuser peacocks around, the victim's response doesn't line up. So again, the victim is the one who seems off. Even when the abuser lies and is caught, it simply seems like an explainable mistake as the victim is too desperate or introverted to speak up. So this is a long intro to get into her research about women's prison. 
Yeah. And here's the thing with Sharon Stone is like, I never think she's a hundred percent right, but I also don't ever think she's like wrong. Like that is true, but it's also a preamble for a role. Yeah. But I also do think it's important to say of everything in this book, I feel like it was important to me to read that whole thing out loud because I think it is important to remember that there is no perfect victim. And yeah, I don't know. That is to, to roll up to the time she spent one day in a women's jail to prepare for a role called Last Dance, not The Last Dance, The Bulls documentary. Or Save the Last Dance. The dance documentary. (laughs) So she spent one day in a women's prison. She says, the moment I arrived and was completely searched, cavities checked, nose, ears, vagina, anus, stripped of all things, including my dignity. I do think it voluntarily checking yourself into a prison for research. I understand that she's pulling this as a relation to the women she met in prison who are unfortunately treated often without any dignity, but she herself was not stripped of dignity. She went there by choice. So then she goes on to talk about how after she got her tumors removed from her breasts, when she went in for reconstructive surgery, the doctor gave her like way bigger bazungas and was just like, I just thought these would look better on you. Which I think is deeply fucked up. It's so fucked up. I wish that would happen to me. (laughs) I mean, I wish I could be like, oh no, my titties are too bad against my will. But it's an absolute violation. No, it's an absolute violation that I do wish would happen to me. (laughs) But she says, but still at some point in all of this, I lost track of myself. All of the self that I'd worked so hard to build, the self-educated woman, the individual thinker, the worldly philanthropist, the movie star, the good friend, the devoted client, the respected professional, the consistent daughter, the good sister, the world traveler, and on and on. It all melted away. And then here's where she gets into one of the biggest question marks of the goddamn book. Yeah. So now she's talking about her baby who she had adopted. There's no mention of of this ex-husband in the book, but she did have an ex-husband who she adopted a baby with named Rowan. And she says, I had loved walking with my baby to the pipe organ concerts I held every weekend at the museum. I loved everything about him, his smell, his little bald head, sprouting white hair, those gigantic blue eyes, his fat feet, which were very smelly. I called him stinky cheese feet. He loved that. And then everything went to shit. She says she can't say exactly what happened because she signed a confidentiality agreement, but essentially she lost custody of her child and she completely fell apart. She says she stopped eating. She had just lain down and given up. Her heart, it seemed, was actually broken. I had an extra beat in the upper and lower chambers of it. She had to go to a clinic because she was diagnosed with anorexia because she just wasn't living. And I want to go back to this. I know I tried not to do some research, but I was like, what happened there? Like, how do you... Because at this point in the book, I didn't know she had a husband. So I was like, well, where did the kid go? Because she's a right. single mom of an adopted child who loses primary custody. I was like, to whomst? To whomst? To her husband, to the father of the child. Who was not mentioned. And unfortunately, in my cursory Googling, one of the reasons she lost the primary custody is that the judge deemed her like an unfit parent. And an example is that she became overwhelmed and like over responded to medical problems. And she has been accused in court documents of wanting to get her four-year-old Botox on his feet because they were so stinky. So when she says, I called him stinky shoes feet, he loved that. And then everything went to shit. I guess it was more than that. It was more than just calling him stinky cheese feet. It seems like she tried to medically treat his stinky cheese feet. (laughs) With Botox. With Botox. And then in the court documents, the dad's like, I just started making him wear socks and went away (laughs) immediately. Which is a lesson we all have to learn the hard way, personally. <laughs> you guys, Claire just learned about socks. What was it, a year and a half ago? I've always known about them. I'm just no. like, I've. you think I didn't know about socks? Of course I knew about socks. I just I feel like you didn't understand socks. You were always, I was a conscientious. When you started wearing socks, you were surprised at how not stinky your feet became. I was not, I knew exactly what You what told happened. me about it. You came to me and you said, you'll not believe this, but wearing socks makes a huge difference. I knew it would, but I just didn't think it was worth it. And then you found out it was worth it. Well, what happened is it turns out you could just buy a lot of socks. I'm not going to fight with you about this. I don't need to fucking explain myself to you. I knew about socks. I was choosing not to engage. I was not at a point financially where I could have a a socky lifestyle. (laughs) And then I started doing better as I got older and I was able to like amass a small small sock fortune. And now I can wear them every day. But when you can't wear socks every day, you have to like build up a sock tolerance. And that's what I was working on. I'm not going to fight with you about this. (laughs) I knew about fucking socks. I was just in a bad place. Everything you literally just said makes it seem like you don't know about socks. I couldn't afford socks. You're going to bully me over it? Yes. I know a lot of financial advisors make fun of people for like drinking coffee, but not 
saving money for a house, I will say you were drinking a lot of to-go coffee and not buying socks. Uh, all the caffeine helped me build an empire that allowed me to buy myself socks later in life. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, so luckily you didn't lose custody over yourself <laughs> in this cir- circumstance. So she has a breakdown. She finds Buddhism. Richard Gere teaches her how to meditate. And then she meets this woman who's like the saint of hugs. And she starts following her around. And she gives her hugs and tells her to put her anger in a cage and like walk away. And I was like, okay. But so then things are like fucking bad. She's falling apart. She obviously lost her kid. She goes, I would cry. I would worry. I couldn't focus on anything but having my son back in my home, in my arms. Nothing else mattered. Just getting my kid back. I lost every single court battle until I didn't. I had been so sick. I had remortgaged my LA house. I couldn't work. Fine. I realized I just had to stop resisting. A few months later in the summer of 2013. Okay, I'm sorry. We just jumped 10 years. All of this was happening like 2001, 2002, 2003 ish. I think she loses custody in 2004. Yeah, but like there's a lot of years missing there. And guess what happens in those years where she doesn't have her child and she's so anorexic that she can't think about anything else that she's following around this hugging lady. She adopts two kids. I mean, no offense, Sharon, but she did just have a very traumatic injury that it took her years to recover from where she suffered from memory loss. And then after having a huge emotional hit, lost the ability to care for herself. And now they're like, but care for two others. I mean, so they gave her one kid because she wanted to adopt on her own. And then when her kid is three months old, she calls up the agency and is like, well, hit me with another. And they were like, yes, okay. It has to be older than that because they're biological brothers. Laird was three months old when I had a dream, a very vivid dream. An angel flew over me and told me that another child was coming to me. I woke up stunned and sure that this was happening. I called the adoption agency. I asked him if they had a child for me and he said, you just got one. I said, I was distinctly aware of that. However, I told him about my dream. He said I was a witch and therefore he would keep an eye out. Four days later, he called me back. I have your child. And I said, how do you know? And he said, it's the same birth parents. That can't possibly be true, right? Yes, but you see how I thought that it was true because that's what it says. Oh, maybe they were pregnant again. Maybe she didn't get the baby yet. In short order, Laird had a brother, Quinn Kelly Stone. This is interesting. She says, I didn't tell them or anyone for a long time that they were biologically related because it didn't feel fair. But then when they were old enough to understand, I brought them to my room and I told them about their special connection. I wonder if she thought it wasn't fair to Rowan. Yeah. But Rowan wasn't even there. So then she talks about how things get better with her kids. Yes, I lost many things. My career, my savings, my residential custody of my son, my so-called marriage, my place in line regarding my career, my former ability to simply look at my page of dialogue for two minutes and have instant recall and the kind of luminous beauty that I hadn't even realized that I'd had, but I was no longer afraid. And without fear, I could decide to keep my integrity. So that's what she gains. Eventually she gets more custody of Roan, I think. Yeah, but it takes a really, really long time. Yeah. I think when he's 15. So then she tells the story of, I guess, a time she got in a lot of trouble with the country of China. And she explains, here's the situation. She was throwing a fundraiser at Khan with Madonna. Madonna didn't show up on time. So she went onto somebody's yacht, raised $2 million with Harvey Weinstein, was super thrilled about it. Somebody asked, what do you think about the way China's treating Tibet and the earthquake that just happened? And she says, I think it's horrible the way they treat Tibet. Maybe the earthquake is their karma. And then she was blacklisted from China. Also, so I want to point out that she says the reason her publicist was not standing next to her when that question came out of left field was because Madonna was late and her publicist had to step away to handle a Madonna situation. So the reason that she was asked by a rogue reporter, a rogue question is because Madonna was late and it led to her getting blackballed in China She still can't go there at time of writing this book. She says she would love to show her children China, but she simply cannot. And she also says that she lost her Dior contract. They didn't fire her, but when her contract was up, they chose not to renew. They also apologized on her behalf, saying the views of Sharon Stone are not the views of Dior. And she felt that that was really unfair. and They would never do that to a man, but I will say... Why would they have hired a man to be the face of Dior? That's not what I was going to say. Oh. I was going to say, she was like, they apologized on my behalf. And they're like, no, they apologized on their behalf because they hired you and people would have gotten back at you via boycotting them. So they did have to do that. They did have to do that. They didn't say Sharon Stone says sorry. They did say, we're sorry. We love China. We would never say anything to hurt your feelings and we don't speak through Sharon Stone. So it's a little bit tough because she's saying, I was thinking, is that karma? I was, I was thinking about that. It's not meant to be an accusation, but a thought, what is karma? Like she is 
incorrect in what she said. You can't say it's karma. That innocent people died in an earthquake. That's not an okay thing to say. So the way she like backtracks over it here, I'm just like, I'm still not on your side, but I do think you shouldn't have like lost work. And I mean, she says it became like a global crisis. People blew it way out of proportion. I do think that that's also not fair. And again, to her point, she's at this event with Harvey Weinstein, with all these other people who are all literal criminals and she's the one who's being criminalized. So she's saying that she had actually already asked for all of the money that they made on the boat to be donated specifically to pediatric AIDS research in China. And then this comment came out and then she was banned from China. And then she says, I don't even know that the money actually got to China. Her feeling is it's fucked up that I got penalized. And meanwhile, I raised millions of dollars for actual people in China. And I don't even know if they ever got it. And still I'm the villain. Yeah. Also in this chapter, and I do think she does a lot of philanthropy and like good and charity work and stuff. But in this chapter, she talks about how stressful these events are. Cause like you have to make sure all the celebrities are on time and who's coming. And one time all of these dresses that were supposed to be auctioned didn't get there on time. So they helicoptered in all these dresses last minute. And I am like, I do think it is poor form to talk about elaborate, expensive, glamorous, over the top party things when talking about raising money. I completely agree with that. And I think that things are starting to shift and people are starting to have more of an awareness of it because there are some websites you can go to when you like look at certain charities to see like how much of the money gets donated to the cause and how much of the money like circles back into throwing elaborate events for more fundraising (laughs) and like paying the people who work there and shit like that. But I do think the way she's talking about how fancy these parties are and making the celebrities happy and whatever. I'm just like, I don't know, man, that sounds expensive. (laughs) So she talks about the work she does with her sister, Kelly. They opened Camp Planet Hope, the first for homeless kids and then homeless kids and their mothers who generally slept outside. They had medical buses from Cedars sinai to assist with dental work for houseless families. She does a lot. She's there. She's like at these events, at these camps at these places doing her best to do what she can. She says, we tried to do all these things and found out that the system itself won't let us. It is illegal to put bathrooms and shelters at the Mexican border for immigrants. In fact, it's a felony. One year we tried to pay off all of the layaways at the biggest department store in the poorest county in America at Christmas time. They wouldn't let us. It seems like they like it when people just can't do it and they get their stuff back. I mean, they do. They do. And then she talks about the death of her father and how as she got older, like their relationship softened. And when he got sick, she ended up building a house on her property so her parents could come live with him. And that was just like a really good bonding experience. He had a very deadly case of esophageal cancer with like 3% chance to make it or something. And she helped him meditate it down. Yeah. So basically they were like, this cancer is inoperable unless for some reason the tumor should shift. And she tells her dad to visualize it moving And it does. So then the tumor does become operable, but then the cancer comes back in different parts of his body. But like four years later, he has a couple years out of it. Yeah, he's given three months and he ends up with four years. So then she has this chapter about all the people she's known that die from cancer. And she does seem to have this very bizarre pattern of meeting people right as they're getting cancer and becoming like their number one lifeline and being there with them when they die. I do think she is a boundaryless woman who means well and can become like very obsessive. And it's definitely odd. I think it's like good nature, but it is weird that like she has these three friends who die from cancer in two years and like two of them she meets right around the time that they get diagnosed. And then she's the one who moves into their house and is taking care of them. She has a lot of very intense friendships and she doesn't talk very much more throughout this book about any relationships. I think she remains single through a lot of it. She might've really liked Dipsy. Oh yeah, that'll help you get through some tough times when you need to just decompress and relax. I don't know what you like. But there's no reason to put yourself in a box. You don't have to define it. You can download Dipsy and have so many options to find what makes you feel good. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy stories designed by women for women. They bring the sexiest scenario that has ever been built in your mind or outside of your mind, and they bring it to life. Stories about firemen, stories about uh, what's other sexy stuff? Butts. Stories about butts. Boobs. Stories about boobs. New content released every single week. So you can listen to your favorite stories over and over again. You can bookmark some favorites or you can just go on the hunt for something brand new that will make you feel, you know, that that new sexy new feeling. You can feel that every single time. Dipsy has sleep stories, wellness sessions and 
written stories that you can read. It's your go-to space to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies, or you don't have to go at it alone. You can heat things up with a partner. Claire. Yeah. How's your dipsy experience going? Horny, horny, horny. <laughs> I love to pop in an AirPod and take things into your own hands. Wink, wink. I found some stuff that I had no idea I'd be into. For listeners of this show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash worm. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash worm, dipsystories.com slash worm. So back to our friendships. They don't last that long. Ashley. <laughs> Ashley, that's sick. Here's a light, a light little laughter before we get back into the heaviest shit. She tells a funny story about when she wore a Gap turtleneck to the Oscars. It was because Vera Wang had designed her a dress. And then for some reason, last minute, they changed it. And so Vera Wang FedExed it to her overnight. And when the FedEx guy was taking it out of the truck, he like dropped it and then backed over it. And so the box busted open and it had tire prints on it. I like cannot fathom how this could have happened. But then she just had to jump into her closet and find some stuff to wear. And so she put on a turtleneck and a skirt and an overcoat. She looks great. She looked great. It was a cool fit. But this is the second time that's happened. So when she was in con, remember that story we told way at the beginning where she wore like a thrown together trousers and male sweater outfit because she lost her luggage. I'm like, why can this girl just not? I have to say, things are always happening in this way. We didn't even get into the fact that her sister fell down by accident once and had a doctor fuck up her surgery, surgery so bad that she was like wheelchair bound for a year. We didn't even get into the fact that both her and her dad were electrocuted as kids. Oh my God, I forgot about the electrocution. Things are just always happening in this way that I'm just kind of like, God, maybe sit down, chill out. Like, why do things keep happening? A lot of things happen things keep happening so then she gets into our me too chapter which is a chapter that i didn't super understand i feel like she has a lot left to work through i just think that she had one good story that she was ready to share and it was the story of her grandfather and her relationship with her mom so she talks about how hard her life has been and how hard it was as women but she doesn't actually out anybody and she doesn't actually explain anything that happened to her she says that there was one director who kind of fired her from set because she wouldn't sit in his lap. But then she says that there's lots of men that she's reached out to personally and been like, I won't ever out you if you agree to come have a conversation with me and like apologize for what you did. And no man has taken her up on it yet. So I'm like, out them, dude. Tell me who. She says that she was often considered difficult. So she would ask and have written into her contract that she wanted actor approval because she wanted to know who she was acting against and she wanted to chemistry test essentially to make sure that the movie made sense and they would just ignore her on it every single time and she says at one point there was an actor who was acting opposite her who was doing a shit job and the producer was like maybe if you have sex with him you guys will have sexual chemistry and she says this happened all the time where they would just like assume she was going to fuck her co-star because then it would make the movie better. And she's like, why couldn't you just hire someone who's good at acting? Why do you think I can like fuck him into being a better actor? That's not how that works. People used to say Sharon Stone has the biggest balls in Hollywood. It's not a coincidence that I was the first woman to get paid something considered respectable. Still a whole lot less than men, but more than what women have been getting paid in the past. And then she's like, look, it's crazy to say that I was intimidating. I was sometimes literally the only woman on set with hundreds of men. There were times where the makeup artists and the costumers, they were all men. Everybody else was a man. I do agree with her. A woman who doesn't take bullshit lying down does strike fear in people. And she's not trying to be intimidating. She's just not being a doormat. And that in itself is intimidating. But then she like goes into this weird thing about how important it is to get practical jurisprudence. And she goes, why must we stand together and stay strong? Where is the law? Do we let our pussy grabbing president take that with him too? I personally do not believe that we did. I believe that there's a great and good court of law for this that must be revised, reviewed, revamped, reclaimed, and reconsidered to respect the sexuality of public as a whole. These women deserve their day in court. I know that to be true. I know that all of the unprocessed rape kits on police shelves everywhere must be processed. I have worked with great men, great creative geniuses, good, decent, fun men, flirtatious, delightful men and women who I would trust with my life and have. So that is why I accept apologies. That is why I hear both sides of every story. I want due process. I want to stand up for the good ones, the wounded and the disbelieved on both sides. I believe in all of what is happening now. The law, not just the press, needs to get in gear on this. This time, this generation, the government needs to listen to us, all of us. 
I don't know. This was like a weird chapter where I'm like, I know you will have something you need to say, but for some reason you're walking this very in the middle line of being like, sure, things have happened to me and it's been tough, but you know, nothing a, a glass of wine can't solve. There's fine people on both sides and I hope everyone's heard and everyone gets their day in court to be tried fairly. This chapter quite a lot frustrated me because I know she's been through things and I don't think anyone owes anyone that information but I also feel like giving us this like walk around version of respect and listen to women by being like the law should handle this. We're so far past that in terms of like, what is the answer? I guess I do think that the generation that she is from so much has happened to them at this point that it's like too late. So then she gets into this whole thing about doing this exercise. She reads by a Buddhist nun where you sit and concentrate on what is overwhelming you. And you ask this energy, this thing to overwhelm you totally to consume you at that point of total consumption. Then you ask how many others are feeling the same exact thing at the exact same time. And you ask to join their energy. I found this to be the most healing and compassionate exercise. It took years of therapy and reading. It took the world changing. It took hashtag me too, to even begin to imagine what we, that I could tell our horrible truths. Even then, who would I tell? How could I unravel a family from its suffering? Not just mine, but quite literally a world of suffering. I think like when you've experienced so much and now she's kind of on the other side of her career, she has to like learn to sit in it. I think there's like so much rage pent up that yeah, like, it's not fair for us to ask her to be at the same point that we would be because she's like lived in much different world. And she also has a section earlier on where she talks about being simply overwhelmed by the amount of things that need changing. She's like, it just is too much. And I became drowned in the amount of shit that needs to happen. And I think that that kind of circles back to this situation too, where it's like, yeah, there are things that can be done instead. But when you really think about it, what helps and like what does something, you can just like end up in a tornado of thought. And so I think that this is where she is right now. She finally goes to an incest support group where she learns to forgive her grandfather. And she's like, he didn't want to be a pedophile. Nobody would choose that. Nobody would stand in line to be a pedophile. And now that he's dead, I can forgive him because he is with God and he's been cured of his illness. And she's like, if he was alive, I'd say he should be in jail, but he's dead. And there's like nothing left I can do. They didn't even talk to their mom about what had happened until... They were in their 20s. So for years, they kept this a secret long past when her grandfather died. My mother's a survivor. My mother's childhood was not at all what I had imagined. Her life was not any of the stories I made up to survive. First, I thought she simply suffered from painful poverty. Then I thought she had been sexually abused and been given away to get her away from that horror. And somehow the madness of all of that had allowed her to leave us with her perpetrator that she had run to my father at 16 to escape whatever life she was having. She seemed to hate me and I was afraid of her. I wanted a mom who was different, yet everyone else seemed to adore her humor and wit, love her beauty and charm. Why did she only hate me? Now she says, I see why you couldn't look at me. Imagine thinking that your daughter couldn't look at you and not knowing why. That breaks my heart. Now that we, my sister and I, are talking to her truthfully, now that we have broken this vow of silence and someone else's shame, now that our perpetrator, dead since we were little, is dead of his control, now that we are present with one another, the real brutality of that is that it's decades later. The stigma put upon us by society, by its shameful lack of action, by secrets and families and culture and religions, misogynistic reality everywhere, is out in the open. Yet we lost a lifetime of love of our family. Today, my mother and I are at the beginning of our relationship. If I hadn't finally stopped keeping this horrible secret, I never would have known her. And then she gets into being like, we need to have a world that's better prepared to help the children. Again, like, I think that's the story she wanted to talk about. And I wish she didn't have to include so much of the other stuff. Like, I wish we didn't even have to hear about her boyfriends or her kids or casino. I do think if she had sat down and talked about the way that this like horror, the generational horror, and I guess what she's saying is her mom didn't even know that he was like that. She knew that he was abusive, but he had never like sexually abused her. So she didn't know she was setting the children up like that. And then of course the children are saying, well, we knew you left at nine. So you must have known and you sent us to him. And of course they hated her because they think their own mother sent them to be abused by their grandfather. She knew he was physically abusive. She shouldn't have let them with them at all. But I mean, that's the story she wanted to tell. And that's the story I think she should have focused on. I don't know. And I also think she should have waited longer because I don't think she's ready to tell the full story yet. She still seems so afraid of it. So she gets into it and she says the beauty of living twice is the beauty of forgiveness. She says, we can reach for that light. We can look into that light. We can carry that light, be that light. And no, we are not digital. We cannot be replaced by that because we are the one thing that matters more. Call it what makes your heart sing, but call it with love because that light will lift you, cleanse you and save you. It is the beauty of living twice. What are your thoughts on our girl, Sharon? I guess I like do have a lot of compassion for her. I feel like she does everything I ask from anybody, which is she genuinely is trying her hardest. I think she's very like, open and vulnerable. I think she would be a nightmare to know personally, but at the same time, 
be like maybe the only person there for you at your moment of darkness. I guess I do think she's just a certain kind of person who had a win in a system that was designed to break her. And even though for a while it seemed like she was on top, it did break her on the inside. And then like slowly it just seeped out through all of her med. Like it couldn't be held together anymore. And for that reason, even though I think she is probably crazy and there's a lot of damning things that we have Googled, I can't help it. I, I feel for her. I absolutely feel for her. I, I do have a lot of interest in the whole story. I mean, the way she tells so many stories, there are just so many glaring holes. And I think we don't even see that that often. I think a lot of times, even though we read books that are obviously from one very specific perspective, they're written in a very, like a way that we don't even know until someone DMs us how much they left out. And this one, you're like, there's more story here. Does good. She cares about forgiveness. She, I think, cares deeply for the people around her. It's very like a sane person in a crazy world. I think she's right to be upset all the time. Yeah. This week, yeah, check out the Patreon. You guys, the wormhole always on Facebook is a really fun to hang out. And new merch, check it out. Yeah. And with that, I would like to thank our five-star reviewers. Thank you to Alfie Numeric. You are the numero uno in my heart. Thank you, Lindsay CH3N. Three cheers for you and your review. Thank you, Susie Snowflake 16. I fucking love that first snowflake of the year. Thank you, MG1893. You are an absolute G. Thanks, Steminist1996. You know how much we appreciate some good stems. Thank you, the Sauvignon Blonde. I'll take one glass, please. Thank you, a worm on frickin' fire. Who has some water? We have to help the worm. Thank you, Ya Haya Haya eight one zero eight nine. I will karate chop anyone who comes your way looking sideways. Thank you, Calliope two three four. You are the Cali Torres to my Arizona Robins. Thank you, Dewey Life. Listen, I'll live the Dewey Life. Just tell me how. Thank you, Marie Re Burgos. Let's throw some Burgos on the grill and have a nice time. Thank you, Lil Cherry Bomb. Ooh, baby, it's exploding. Thank you, Cass198944. I will cast you as the star of this review. Thank you, Ash D, for being the beautiful review under that wormy on fire. Thank you. I know you're reading my name. She's in the room. They're watching. Thank you, Jack I R S C H. Jack Irish. Jack Irish. Listen, you know I love the Irish, so we'll call it that. And that's all for this week. I adore you guys so much. Thank you. And we'll see you in two weeks.